that Barb and I had that happen on a number of occasions <laughs> as well. Well, again, we're really, really glad that you're here and that you're willing to take the time to go through this. The whole objective of this particular fellowship, gathering, course, whatever you want to call it, is not only getting to know GBC, but getting to know each other as well. Everybody comes from different backgrounds. A church these days is very much about fit. Uh, a generation ago, it was more about you living in a community and maybe going to church in and around that community that was pretty close. And, and that still does exist to some degree. But in many cases today, uh, church is more about how you believe at the current state that you're in, does this place best fit where we're at right now? And sometimes that means folks may be at a church for 20 or 30 years. Sometimes that means it gets adjusted depending on the different situations. It could be a pandemic. It could be a different life space with, with where your kids are. Some churches have kids' ministries and teens' ministries. Some churches don't, not because maybe they don't want to, but maybe they can't. And, and that just throws everything in an uproar. And that's, just, that's the world we live in. Uh, years ago, uh, I gave up on the battle of, of trying to fight sports, too. I mean, I don't hate sports. I love sports. But when they started doing sports on Sundays, I knew I wasn't going to win that battle either. And Barb will constantly say to me, she would say, Chris, don't worry about that. If you have a 9 o'clock service and they come to that, maybe they come to Sunday school, or maybe they miss two weekends, You'd much rather have them coming at all and still doing things with their family than feeling like sports is the great demon Satan. <laughs> and, and she's right. And so I'm not, you know, we don't fight these battles anymore, but, but we adjust as a body in Christ. And how do we work with each other in these different seasons of life in which we find ourselves to be a blessing and encouragement? Our journey, and that's going to look a little different in each home. So for Barb and me, uh, Barb grew up in New York, just outside of New York City, North Jersey, and then on, yeah, and then on the North Shore of Long Island. And I grew up in Philadelphia. We met in college our first year back in the early '80s, and then we were married in 1984. Um, went back from college back up to the Philadelphia area for me to attend seminary and then I interned at a couple of different churches and then in the, the second church that we were interning in uh, we had a, a, a situation occur that changed our lives forever although at the time I thought it ruined our lives forever. I grew up in a great home wonderful home but not necessarily Christianized we went to church probably once a month and it was what was ever closest to us. Uh, wonderful parents, a great brother and great sister. Uh, Barb grew up in a Christian home. Uh, she lost her mom to cancer when Barb was only seven. Her mom was 32. But that cancer brought her mom and her dad to faith in Christ. And they ended up attending a church around the corner from their neighborhood in North Jersey that then eventually brought Barb to Jesus, and, and that's great. What brought us and our family to a closer walk was my mom, she trusted Jesus through reading one of those uh, daily bread uh, devotionals. And then my dad got saved by reading a gospel track. And neither one of them completely understood what happened to them. And, and then there was a, a pastor in the 70s that was church planting. And my dad was like, oh, that, that's kind of what I think I've been reading about in the Bible. We ought to start going to your church. That's when I first started hearing the gospel, when I was a junior and senior in high school, then went off to college, and then eventually, uh, just before graduating college and just before getting married, uh, I trusted Christ as well, after the Lord just kind of pummeling my heart <laughs> for three or four years. He wouldn't let go. I'm so grateful for that. So after Barbara and I were married, we went up to, back to PA, seminary, interning. We hit this church. And it was, it was a small church right next to Princeton University, and it was a good experience. It was 30 minutes from where we were living. And we're two and a half years in, and I'm still driving to, to school an hour each way every day. And we noticed a situation developing within the deacons where the one deacon was counseling the other deacon's wife privately in her home while her husband was at work. 
Now, there just wasn't something that was registering like a safety valve on that. So we just, Barb and I, we were in our 20s. We just said, hey, we're just making an observation here. We really believe, especially in serving in this capacity, that this is probably maybe not the best way to go about doing this. And little did we know that that decision would be the total undoing of our life over the next 10 months. The church was uh, small, and uh, there were business meetings going on, and there was a particular business meeting one evening in March of 1991, and the deacon got up to present the financials to the, to the congregation and proceeded to destroy Barb and me right in front of the congregation with lies and filth and it was so, it was, because oh, he was trying to cover his backside for what he was doing. All the Barbara and I wanted to do was, we think you're going to get yourself into a big heap of trouble in your marriage if you keep doing that, and it's probably not honoring to the Lord. Just could you change that problem? I'm not saying you can't be friends with the family or anything like that. Well, the congregation was aghast. How could we get ourselves involved in their lives that way? And everything then went to that family. Like we literally instantaneously lost all credibility. And we were destroyed. I mean, we felt totally defeated. Well, we hung out there for several more months, but I gotta tell you, it was brutal. And we said, there's no way. How are we gonna rebuild? It's it's us against the couple that's been here for years. And we're just, you know, young young and dumb, and so we stepped out of that, and I told Barb right then, I'll never forget this, I said, this is what church is going to be like for the rest of our lives, I mean, we're, we're done. I think the experience we had with minute, like going to Bible college and seminary, all good, wouldn't change that for the world, grateful for all of that, we had some wonderful experiences, but this, no, didn't sign up for that, or did we? As Philip prayed in his prayer, <laughs> or did we? What we found after pulling back and literally asking God, what, what is next? So for six months after that, we, we just didn't know what was going to happen. And in the middle of that, got a phone call from a guy that we knew in Wayne Burkmeyer, he and his wife, Betty. They lived in this area. They were up in Pennsylvania attending the same church my parents were attending because he was on a military contract with the Navy base. And he says, you may not remember me, but uh, when you graduated from college and went to seminary, we were up in that area, and here's what God's doing in our life. Uh, we're having to make some changes, and he keeps bringing you and Barb into mind, and we think God wants you to come down here and plant a church. So after we got finished laughing and yucking it up, <laughs> uh, we agreed to come down in September of that year and just hang out with them. Why not? Why not come down and visit Fauquier County, Virginia? Loved it. Loved spending time with them. It was Refreshing, it was encouraging. Next thing we know, it's November of 91, and suddenly God's working on our heart again. Could we get involved in this? Could we actually step back into something? We didn't know what it was because we didn't have any people. So for the next 30 days from November, basically Thanksgiving to <coughs> Christmas of 91, we committed to coming, even though we had no idea what was going to happen. And in that time, God opened up a house. 15 people, and a place to meet for our first service in January of 1992. And the reason I go into that is because that really set the stage for these last, literally, 30 years. Right? And everything from the whole grace message, like, we, we had been involved, particularly in the situation with that church there in Jersey, it was very... Uh, a little constraining, like more legalistic, and we were having trouble breaking some of those barriers, and so grace was a, was a direct outgrowth of that. Of course, it's a biblical principle, but never never realized how wonderful the principle of grace would be, not only for salvation, but for Christian living as well. Barb and I, coming down here, felt like literally we had gotten saved all over again. I mean, that's the joy that he brought back into our life. Coming down to 15 people that were just loving on us and didn't care what our backgrounds were, didn't come with any pretentiousness <coughs> about them, and we met in a living room in January of 92 to get things kicked off. 
Shortly thereafter, uh, we moved to the fire hall here in Marshall. They had it upstairs, and we were able to meet in there. And from there, we went to Coleman Elementary School. From Coleman Elementary, we went to Fresta Valley Christian School for a couple of years. Uh, Donna and John Bloom were awesome, letting us use their place. Even though it's eight miles from here, we felt it was a little bit off the beaten path from ultimately where we needed to be. So we were constantly praying about, could we get back in Marshall? Could we get back in Marshall? Community center then opened up, and so we moved there then in 1997. And then from 97 to 2003, we met at the community center. By then, there was probably 150 <coughs> people coming, and then bought this property after scouring land all over from south of Warrington to up this direction, we finally gave up because it was too much land, not enough land, too much money. We just, it was just done. In the grocery store, for those of you who remember the good old days back in Marshall when it was just the IGA, the Trumbos, Bob Trumbo approached me and said, listen, there's a family over here just, uh, just south of town and they want to talk to you about some property. I said, Bob, we have looked everywhere in the land. So I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so we met them at the grocery store. And Mr. and Mrs. Payne, Hunter and Jeanette, said, we understand you guys are looking, blah, blah, blah. We know where there's 15 acres. I said, I've turned over every rock <laughs> in and around 66, so please tell me. They said, well, the property is actually not for sale unless you and the church think it's right for GBC. Oh, well, where is it? It's right off the exit. <laughs> so Mr. and Mrs. Payne own the little house right behind us. And Mr. Payne has since passed, and Mrs. Payne, she probably won't make it the rest of this year. She is coming down the home stretch, if you will. But they sold us this 15 acres for $125,000, and their whole family was all for it. They were all for it. And the only request that they had for us is that we put a steeple on the building. That was the only thing that they asked. And so, uh, bought the property, put a design together that you see here, and then we ended up being here starting in 2004. And along this journey, I have to tell you, with very few exceptions, you, if you're ever at a place long enough, there's always going to be exceptions. But with very few exceptions, this has been one of the greatest experiences of our lives. Bar none. We have experienced the love of Christ directly from you over the years. We have witnessed God doing amazing things that we didn't think were possible. Everything from physical building stuff to hearts and people who we say, oh, that person will never change. Or this. I mean, absolutely incredible. And that has really been an incredible blessing to us, particularly in the times that were challenging, deeply challenging, whether they were things personal with our own family or with Lauren's situation. Uh, it has been really amazing, the sustaining grace that is poured out, not only by Jesus, but by those of you within this fellowship and this greater body of people have been awesome. And I have to tell you, one of the most difficult things for us over the years has been the, not only the influx, but the outgo of many people because of our area. I mean, we've had more than 40 families retire and relocate just in the last seven years because it's hard to live here. People are done. It's not that they don't like it, but they go other places or they go to their grandkids or... And that's fine, too. That has been challenging for us, just to see people go. Today's service, I mean, we love Jack and Lindsay. But this is, to be honest with you, it's hard because of the relational. What we found, what Barbara and I found, is that we tend to be a little more uh, relational. I don't come from like a corporate background. I don't view church as a corporation CEO component. Um, and I realize that big churches have to go through different things, but smaller churches, you don't really necessarily, you don't have to have that. And I'm not necessarily built that way. And so the relational end of things has been very good, but it also can be very heartrending as well. So we have four children. 
you heard a little bit, uh, Elizabeth Mary Davy Bass, and they have uh, our three grandkids, uh, Jonah, Ashlyn, and now Bella. They are seven, six, and one, and they're a blessing. They live in Amosville, so they're really still close by. And then we have Lauren. She's our uh, just, again, good kid, but she has something called the Georgia Syndrome, and that has pressed us. Uh, on a number of cases from physical background to other areas. She lives with us in our home. She's in a good place right now, which we're grateful. And then Katie is married to Matthew, Matthew Hayes. Uh, they met here in church as well. And they, they met when they were 14. And Katie is due anytime. Uh, she's in the oven. She has uh, little Macy Ray in the oven right now. And right, literally any day right now. And uh, they, they live here in the area as well. And then Christopher our true Virginian redneck uh, <laughs> farmer. Uh, Chris knows farming, he's 24, and uh, he's, again, he's a great kid, and uh, he, got, he has the privilege of working for Sid Rogers at Mariah Farm full-time. He, uh, he went to Liberty, but he wasn't really a, he doesn't like conventional school, to be honest, he's great with his hands, he's creative. So he said, Dad, I'm gonna be a firefighter. Yeah, sure, we'll back you. Dad, it's too boring being a firefighter in Fauquier County. We, we still do enough. Great, I'm going to be a police officer. He goes, Dad, I'm taking down every MS-13 gang member in the <laughs> Mount Vernon area of Fairfax County. So we got hired on by Fairfax County as a police officer. He said, Dad, what's going to happen here is you're going to be getting me out of jail because the amount of legal constraints that we have to face out here is so terrible, it's destroying the morale everywhere. And in the meantime, Sid Rogers from Mariah Farm came up to him and said, Chris, I will offer you a lifetime position as a farmer if you want to be that. He had worked for Sid for a number of years. And so Chris is farming, and he's loving it. So if you get mad at the guy driving down 17 or these side roads and these big honking things that take up the whole road, decent chance that it's him. <laughs> so that, that's us in a nutshell. Barb is the love of my life. We've been married 37 years. Uh, she is, God knew exactly, exactly what I needed. I, it's just, she is extraordinary. I, I'm a little animated and uh, off the chip. Barb is calm. <laughs> she, she is so, so very good. So that's us a little bit of a nutshell. You, you can see on the opening pages of your book there, uh, the foundation's welcome. There's a picture of our family when Christopher was going through one of the academies. And uh, we, we didn't have all the grandkids. Let's flip that over. You can see the foundation's schedule there. We've, we've kind of gone over a little bit of history and our background. And what you can go through is each one of these sessions. We'll probably, it's designed to go seven weeks. We've got five. A couple of times we'll go through two sessions at one time. You'll get to meet some of the elders along the way as well. Flip that over to the first section. This next document, believe it or not, is one of the most important that I believe any church can have. When, when you're attending a church, going to a church, whether it's this one or whatever church you may get involved in down the road, whatever that looks like, try to find out if, if they have some sort of, of document that helps them with their, their glue, if you will. <laughs> whether it's a theological statement or a mission and, and ministry statement. It just kind of helps keep things together. What, what was helpful for us was when we were putting some of the founding ideas together, what were some of the things that were non-negotiables? And some of this comes from your backgrounds, right? Like from us, we didn't want, to, we didn't want legalism to overtake right. us. Some of you come from backgrounds where maybe there's some things that you would say, oh, we would, we would never want to see that again. Or, yeah, we love this. Or how come you don't do this? This was an outgrowth of some of the probably early to mid stages of the church. It morphed for maybe the first 15 years. And then finally we came down with a document dealing with ministry and mission. So these are core values. These are things that overall would represent us. Passages of scripture coming from Ephesians 4 and Acts chapter 2. We tried to do everything that we could based on scriptural precedent. We didn't, we didn't want to just take a corporate structure we wanted to say, what, well, what does God say about grace? Or what does God say about this? How did the early church do things? And even though things within Acts weren't always prescriptive or normative, 
there were principles there that we felt that were important as well, particularly as you see the letters of the church develop. You'll see five components throughout. The words that you see when you walk through the, the sanctuary door, whether you've ever looked up there or not, okay, uh, that say basically come, connect, grow, serve, and go, those five words come together with these main five words here. You have worship, service, fellowship, outreach, and discipleship. They, they, they all have connections to this. And, and I'm not going to labor all of these points. I just want you to see from our relationship to God, we want it to be grace-awakened, Christ-centered, prayer-focused, and intentionally obedient. Do we hit those all the time? No. We strive to. We hope that they're, they're more actual than aspirational. And then from discipleship or growth or, or relationship to the truth, we want to be Bible-believing. That is a key component. Above anything else, with our worship and relationship with Jesus, we want, by His grace, to be a Bible-centered church, not just a culturally-centered church or whatever the next fad is that's out there. Service, relationship to ministry, members. Now, listen. When I say member here, I use that word loosely. We do have a membership, and we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. But that is all of us serving together as body of Christ. That's really what the component is for that. We would like to try to create an environment where as many people as possible could serve and as many things as possible that are offered within the fellowship, some of which you will end up starting, some of which may be already existing. And then within that, have rotational components to that. That's why we do what we do with music. You know, I could ask Joey or Jamie to say, hey, listen, uh, I, I need you guys to step it up. You, know, you, you need to be up there every week. Well, I'd rather have them here for the long term like they've been than burn them out because we maybe just like what they do and do it every week. That's why there's 25 different people on the music team because we think that that's important that we can rotate through. It means that maybe from one day to the next, you might get a little bit of a different layer. But in the end, it's for the overall composition of what's going on in the ministry. Fellowship, uh, relation, relationship oriented, family oriented. We like to promote family. Uh, where, where families want to come and do things together, great. I, I, we have kids church, but sometimes families aren't comfortable putting their kids in kids church for various reasons. Maybe there was a situation that occurred, or uh, maybe they just like them to be with them for the time being. Fine. If they climb babies or could, well, if the kids are climbing over the chairs and hanging <laughs> off the people, that may be a bit of an issue. One of the things I loved about being outside was you were all bringing your dogs and your cats and all that stuff. And kids were climbing trees out there. I, I thought that was great. I yeah, don't have any problem with that. And then outreach, a uh, relationship to the world. We'd like to be in, at an outreach based church from the standpoint of whether things are going on here or from a global missions perspective as well. All right, go to the next page, mission statement, and then we'll get to the Q&A. There's those five principles again. The mission statement of the church is to exalt God by faithfully teaching his word and consistently sharing his gospel. And that, that's simple. Exalt God, first and foremost. Uh, Westminster Confession, right? First principle, why are we here? Uh, glorify God. I mean, that's, so we exalt him, let's faithfully teach the word, let's consistently share the gospel message. Uh, I like to alliterate in my outline, so there you go. Exalt, edify, equip, encourage, evangelize, and allow me to breathe a little bit if I can have all the E's there in that center section under worship, discipleship, and service. And then our overall vision is doing life together. <coughs> how do we exalt God by doing those things from the Great Commission? But how do we do it together? And as Philip prayed early, life together can be very messy. Because it's full of people like us. Yeah, you, you're exactly right. And there's those five statements there at the bottom that come, connect, grow, serve, and go. The messy part works okay when things are unearthed and we're willing to deal with them. It's not okay when hearts are hard and super difficult and we become obstinate. I have found that most of us are willing to work through messiness. We do it with our kids all the time. When we see palatable, pliable 
parts. And that's, that's where we want to be. So when we do life together, hopefully we'll be there to encourage and pick each other up. And that when people interface with us, we're doing that hopefully with good attitudes and hearts and mind. It's one of the things I've appreciated about our staff and elders as well. And they know that they can talk to me about anything they want, whenever they can call me on the carpet, they can do whatever they want. From that standpoint, I mean, one of the things that Barb and I have learned over the years is that it's important to endeavor to be as transparent as possible without compromising. Now, I know Lauren sometimes gets a little nervous when I use her as an illustration, but I try not to compromise who she is as a, as a person with all of her challenges and, and backgrounds. But again, being transparent has been a more healthy approach over the long than not. And then you can see how all of that doing life together develops. And then the last page, how does that relate to outreach? And then you can see the different global partners and regional partners and community projects and current support base that we have. From a mission standpoint, uh, we've elected to support less missionaries from more money. What we were getting a resounding feedback from on our current missionary teams were not the 25, the 50, the 75, and the $100 a month. Great, you know, you can get it, but we really want to get to the field. The average is 39 months for the average missionary that says, we're willing to go, and by the time they get there. By doing more resources for them, they were able to get to the field much quicker. And so we have developed some, some consortiums with other churches. We'll be like, hey, this, this person's awesome. Uh, we'll go in. 400, 500 a month, you do the same thing, we get these folks here in this church, and let's get them there. And that's that's been very, very helpful. And bar none, we have never had a missionary come back and say, please never do that. In fact, <laughs> a lot of the folks, I get calls all the time from different missionary couples that don't know anything about our church, but they're okay, looking for support. And I'll say, listen, this is nothing against you guys. But Here's what we're doing. Here's what's actually going on in our church right now. We are not in a position to support you, and here's why. Even the people that are calling us, hearing that philosophy, wish their own home church would have that philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I'm even getting it from them as well. So for the time being, that's what we're here. All right, Q&A on any of that. Uh, please, anything. And maybe something will come up later. You can always email me or give me a call or text me about something. So these are these are core values based on those five principles, and hopefully they're reflective of who we are as a church. How does the elder accountability thing work here, like with the elders under you, and how do you relate to that? Okay, mm -hmm. now, I'm going to give you a tease, mm -hmm. and then we actually cover that in section three or four. Okay. But the way that this works here, we currently have uh, four elders plus myself. And I'm known as, in, in the way we do things here, so typically in church polity or church government, you either have, in general, elder rule or congregational rule. Neither one is necessarily bad or worse. Um, take this over the other. We lean here. Ours is a modified elder position. So congregational rule, that's where the, the, the church body makes a decision over everything. And maybe you've been in a couple churches like that. It's like, okay, we're, we're, we're changing that carpet. And six years later, <laughs> after 42 committee meetings, you are now ready to make a decision on the carpet. Now, I, I know I'm, I'm being a little aggressive on that. Some churches are like that where the congregation literally runs everything all the time. Elder rule is typically when the elders, whoever they might be, two, three, four, five, ten, depending on the size of the church, they are kind of in charge of running the church, and the church is informed on things. Okay, again, either one, better or worse, right or wrong, per se. God seems to be, in the Bible, uh, allow for some modification of this. And so we have a modified elder rule. So we do have congregational input on multiple levels, 
but the church in its basis is run by an elder team and its staff. So in other words, how does that work? For us, there are four things, and it's kind of a good segue. The, the Constitution and bylaws, which are next, if you need to flip that over, addresses this very thing in the bylaw section. So that the church is in charge of voting on a budget, voting on its full-time pastor, the purchase of any property, or any changes to the Constitution. So in other words, I can't get up and say one day, uh, oh, by the way, uh, we don't believe that Jesus died on the cross anymore. Uh, we believe something else, and that's the way it's going to be. Now, I would have to present that ludicrous statement, and then you guys would say, oh, sorry, that's not happening. You have to go. <laughs> so that, you know, see what I'm saying? What we have here is, is what has been already presented and laid out to make changes we would then have to, we have to make our case. And then that goes to a ballot vote for those who are members. That's how that goes. Same thing with property. Uh, I just can't go out and say, man, I love that 66 acres over there. Uh, we're gonna build Taj Mahal, and we're gonna hire you to run the school, and that's the way it's gonna be over there. Done, when do we start? I would have to present that. And then we would then agree or not agree as a church to you know, buy that land or even add to our existing plant. You know, we, we have some rumblings now that we may have to bring to the church regarding uh, an additional facility out back for kids and teens and multi-purpose. So we, we, we've had drawings made, you know. So don't be surprised over the next couple of months if you hear about uh, a further vision on that. But again, I, that has to go to you. Uh, senior pastor for hire. We just can't say, oh, who's this guy? Well, with Philip, Philip's not in this position, but he is part of staff. You guys give us authority to hire staff, even some in the pastoral mode, because of this. Last year when we put the budget together, we said, we are looking to bring on some part-time staff, pastoral staff, and some interns. So Philip became part of that. And then we have three interns as well. We have Genevieve, Mason, and Josh. Josh is in the back. Thank you, Josh. Josh and Mason have been working diligently on a lot of our AV stuff. I'm so appreciative of them doing things. Genevieve has helped out in the kids' ministry. She's here all the time. Both of these, or all three of these, are uh, late high school or graduates in early college. And that's worked out fantastic. Philip. Uh, he has a military background, grew up in the area. He and Brenda are here doing multiple things and teaching at Crested Valley. But then those decisions were made based on what was presented in November and what was voted on in December by the members of the church. That, that makes sense? So as an elder crew, we constantly are going through all of this stuff. And we'll meet and we'll pray over different things within the church or they'll lay out things to discuss vision. They'll ask me, how am I doing? Sometimes we include the wives of the elders in those meetings because what I've learned over the years, if I don't do that, I'm missing something. Okay? The wives of the elders have been awesome. And they often uh, unearth something about relationships, just amongst ourselves, which is very helpful, or have insight into things that are so fundamentally helpful and important. And that has been really, really good. I, I don't know if that's, that's just in a real no, nutshell. We'll get, we'll get into the weeds a little bit more when we get into that section. Go Can on. I add just a little bit to that? Yes. The, in the question, if I may, the, the idea of the elders being under him would never be something that he or any of the elders would say. Um, that some churches, if there's a third category, it's kind of a, a more hierarchical, where the authority comes down. Some people would call this an Episcopal form of church governance, some Presbyterian churches, the higher courts have authority over the lower courts. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change, if they change their doctrine and you don't go along, you lose your building because the authority comes down. Not all Presbyterians are that way, but some are. Um, and so there's even some uh, kind of closer to us evangelical churches where it's like everything's in the pastor's name. He's in charge. The elders are guys he picks. Um, 
we're, we're nowhere even in that category. Um, That's a really good and you're, point. The so elders aren't under you. They're, they're right. I'm only viewed as the first among equals. If, if there's a decision that we're making, and we're all, it could go either way. It's a mox mix. In other words, they, like, they could literally go either way. They'll say to me, Chris, what do you sense on this? And we will defer. <laughs> Bless you. And do, you, know, you know what I mean by that? And furthermore, when it comes to elders, we don't just get up one day, even though they're not paid here, per se, uh, currently, we wouldn't say, oh, by the way, uh, here, here's, your, here's your next nine elders. We bring those before the church for presentation, prayer. We, say, we, we would love for you to, to consider, and here's why. We, do that. we don't vote on it. But we just say, hey, if you have ever, if you have something you'd like to say to me about this or to this person, hey, we got the next couple of weeks, go ahead and do that, and then we'll do an install. We'll have a, a prayer over them, and then welcome them in as, as, as elders. And we do the same thing for deacons as well. But again, we'll get a little bit more into the weeds on that, and I've, I've got a PowerPoint thing that we go through. And Yes, Ernest? How would you describe the elder's relationship with the body? Oh, that all depends. So I've had elders who are retired, and their relationship to the body has been a little better relationally because they have more time. Our current team all work full time, their schedules are nuts, some of them still have kids at home, and they're a little bit more, they're maybe not as engaged with everybody as even they would like to be. And so overall, they want to be engaged. I'll try to have some of them, when you meet some of them in here over the coming weeks, some of them will teach from the pulpit or in small groups uh, because as one of the qualifications, we want them to be engaged in that way. But I look, we look for uh, men of character, first and foremost, and then ability, second. And again, most of them are very relational. For those of you who've met Tim and Sean, and uh, Gary and Jamie, uh, they're, they're, they're typically very, very engaged. Most of them head up at least one ministry within the church as well. I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I'm going to have my hair and eyes. The worst day in here. <laughs> but I didn't hear the last time. I, I hope I'm, I, I'm, I'm not dancing around your question. I hope I'm, I'm answering it in some fashion. No, but I have travel in those shoes. Gotcha. <clears throat> yes. So you would you would know. I what I've learned is I've really appreciated I think frankness and ability to communicate with a team has been very, very helpful. So like one of the issues with me is that I'm feeling pressed. My wife knows this, and I'll do this to her, unfortunately, as well. I tend to compartmentalize everything, including her. So I put Barb over here, but then what happens is that sometimes says, oh, you're not interested in my input on these matters. No, I, I'm really, I, I, I'm not saying that, but well, maybe I am, because that's what I'm doing. Sometimes with the elders, I'll do the same thing. So that if they don't see me talking with them about maybe certain issues or items or if I'm quiet, they know that they have the right to oh, come. Thank you for being quiet. To, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can. to literally come at me in a way that draws some of that stuff out. And I, since I know that I'm in a safe space with them, I can do that, and they've been very good. I feel the same way. Like Barb always makes me feel in a safe space. So even though at times I might go that way, she's able to bring that out, and these guys work the same way. I know without a shadow of a doubt they love me, they have my back, and they love this church. And that, that is fantastic. So, great. Other, other questions on anything that we've discussed at this point? What I would like you to do as a homework assignment for next week is just, if you haven't had a chance to go through the church constitution and bylaws, just go through it. I'm not saying you have to read every word, but just go through it. Get an idea of what's in there, how do things operate. You'll see some things that are familiar to what we've already discussed, some things that maybe are like, oh, 
maybe we can talk about that. Bring that up. And then next week, we're going to combine this session with session three. Because that's also a doctrinal section as well, dealing with baptism and communion. So we'll, we'll do the, the, the doctrinal components of two and three will come all next week. So if you want to go ahead and leap into that, and that will be under your number three tab, and you can go through that. There's, there's other things, like I've got the church's position on marriage, divorce, and remarriage in here as well. I like to throw that in because sometimes people ask, well, what do you think about that? Well, there you go. <laughs> and you may not like what I think about <laughs> and then, I, years ago, we put this thing together called the Christian Liberty Decision Grid. And this has been a really good and helpful tool. Like, how do we work through the gray areas of a Christian I mean, Barb and I have made a decision. We don't drink alcohol. But I'm not saying you don't have to drink alcohol. We don't drink alcohol because we have a lot of alcoholics in our church, former alcoholics that have become Christians. I'm not going to set up an issue with them. And I don't want to create a stumbling block for somebody. But does the Bible say that you can't drink? No. You can. In a, in a really good way. You're not inebriated and you're not creating a testimony problem. Great. Well, that's under the Christian Liberty Decision Group. Now, you may not like that decision. And I would say to you, tough apples. <laughs> but it's, it's those kinds of things that are in there. And we break them out into different ways. Category. So hopefully you'll have fun reading through those as well. And you might throw some things in the different categories and maybe what I'm saying. Great. Thank you. We are out of time. I'm going to ask if Matt Bass would have a closing word of prayer for us. And then uh, we'll join again next week. Please, any questions, email me. And then we'll, um, we can address it with Father God, again, we just are grateful for this day, grateful for this church, and grateful for the way that you uh, bless and protect and provide for each one of us. We pray that you uh, continue to uh, bless the gathering and uh, Chris's sermon this morning, and we just uh, thank you and praise you, Jesus. Thanks, everybody.